Welcome, everyone. Uh, if you could do me a favor, if you are next to an open seat that doesn't have yellow and black tape over it, raise your hand. Okay, so the people in some of the aisles can scoot in. Thank you. All right, we're very honored to have uh, Fei-Fei Lee from Stanford here today, and uh, I will hand over the introduction to our department chair, Jitendra. <laughs> Hello. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Fei-Fei Lee for the department colloquium. Uh, Fei-Fei has uh, got her undergraduate degree in physics at Princeton. Then she was at uh, Caltech for a PhD with uh, Pietro Perona. And, uh, after moving around a little bit, she has somehow landed up at Stanford, our favorite place next door, yeah. where she is. Uh, with uh, or without sarcasm? And yeah, she is currently the director of the Stanford AI Lab, in addition to her role as the lead of the, the lead of it in the Stanford lab, and a very prominent figure in computer vision. I want to say a little bit about her research. I've known her since, uh, I think she, she was a baby, which to me means <laughs> a graduate student <laughs> age because her, her advisor, <laughs> Pietro Peruna, was, was my uh, former PhD student. And uh, uh, what characterizes her work and what I love about her work is really that she pays attention to many different aspects, not just computer vision, but also machine learning in the days when that needed to be said explicitly. Also, neuroscience and, uh, and psychology. And uh, so one of her earliest papers that I loved were, was work on sort of attention and what tasks we could do while, when attention were divided, or tasks on how much inference we can make from a single glance at a picture. So it's, it's not just technical work. It's work which gets at some of the conceptual issues in, in, uh, in vision. Then uh, she decided to pick on this, this goal, which was to create this humongous data set of uh, images, because uh, it seemed that it would be a way to push forward research in uh, computer vision. And uh, I have to tell you my story on this, because she actually consulted me on this, and I said, don't do it. <laughs> because I said, it's not advisable for an assistant professor to devote her tenure, her tenure prospects to, to building a data set because who knows how the community is going to react to the creation of a data set. But she ignored me, which was very good. Because, uh, it's because the only time I ignored you. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, uh, subsequently, uh, we all know about uh, the, uh, the development of deep learning. But in fact, it's little recognized that the algorithms for deep learning, which are very popular now, are basically the same as from the late 1980s. The two, bit di the two big differences are that you have GPUs, for which we have to thank our colleagues in the hardware business. And of course, there was the availability of data on the web, which permitted the annotation of huge data. And which is what Fei-Fei's ImageNet project did. So they had a million images annotated with a thousand categories. And uh, uh, the they, they way they got started on this was, a, 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 I mean, Hinton put a student of his to work on trying to beat ImageNet numbers. And they were able to show that uh, the error rate came down from 25% to 15%. And that changed the whole field of uh, AI to some, uh, some extent. But Fefe does lots of other work, too. And <laughs> I'm sure we are going to hear more about that. So without further ado, please welcome Fefe Lee. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to mention that yes, she has zillions of awards, but oh, I no. know her too well to mention all of them. No. Okay. Thank you, Jitendra. And I follow a very proud lineage. Um, I, th I think, wait, do I need this? You are, you are already mic'd up. So yes, right, yes. I don't need this. All right, uh, so normally I would say it really gives, every time I come to Berkeley, it just gives me so much the happiness and fun because seeing all my friends and colleagues and academic grandpa 
Uh, today, <laughs> today it's actually particularly good for me because I really needed coming here for some therapy. So, thank you for uh, <laughs> for uh, being here. And uh, I, so, I'm going to share with you a, a story of um, a quest for visual intelligence of the field of computer vision from my personal work's point of view. And uh, but there is an elephant in the room that I just want to spend one second on. I was I actually literally have to take out my second slide, which I prepared, which was a happy one. But uh, now I'm gonna actually just show this slide. This is supposed to be my last slide of the talk. But I want to bring it up to really acknowledge the people who actually, they're my students uh, who have um, for, uh, former and current students who have done most of the work I'm presenting today. I, in the middle of last night, I was looking at this slide, and this is the slide that gives me hope. This is the slide <laughs> of the America I know, right? The, the <laughs> I, maybe I'm still living in a bubble, but this is a slide of amazing women, amazing people of color, LGBT members, uh, people of various disability, people of all kind of races and country of origin. And they are the ones who, uh, you know, who have defined my life, my career as a professor, and th they are the ones who is pushing the field of AI. And uh, I look in this audience, and no matter what happens, this is where the hope lies. So, so that's. <laughs> I've been crying all uh, the whole night, so hopefully I don't cry now. <laughs> all right. So with that note, let's talk about visual intelligence. And uh, I'm going to actually start 540 million years ago. And that's where um, life is very different. The, the earth was mostly water, and the animal kingdom was very, very simple. There were several species, a few species of uh, animals floating in the water. And when food passes by, they take a bite. If it doesn't, they just chill. It's a little bit like August in Europe. And, uh, <laughs> But something really weird happened um, during the time of 540 million years ago to 530 million years ago. In evolutionarily considered very short period of time, less than 10 million years, um, the number of species exploded in the animal kingdom. And uh, what the zoologists and evolutionary biologists call this period is the Cambrian explosion. And there were very many theories of uh, what would result in Cambrian explosion. Um, but fast forward, after you know, hundreds of years of research, fossil studies, climate studies, and all this, there has been a very prominent theory proposed by a young a zoologist called Andrew Parker from Australia. <coughs> he says, it is the beginning of eyes that changed the animal uh, kingdom 540 years ago. Precisely, his in his own words, the Cambrian explosion is triggered by the sudden evolution of vision in animals, which set off an evolutionary arms race where animals either evolved or died. So. When the first trilobite developed the apparatus very similar to a simple pinhole camera, suddenly there is literally light. And once you can see light, you can see food. Suddenly, you start chasing after food. Uh, so, so there is a passage in his book that, imagine you're the first trilobites who have eyes. The whole world is your buffet because the other animals don't know how to escape from predators. So they're just floating there, and you just grab whatever you want. And then slowly, the evolutionary engines start to turn. The prey start to develop their own vision system to hide from the predators. And all these speciations happens. So it is the onset of vision that drove the evolution 
that, that speeded up evolution in animals and started to, uh, that put a really strong force in the development of vision and intelligence. So after 540 million years, our animal kingdom, by and large, with very few exceptions, are full of animals that use vision as their primary visual, uh, primary sensory system to survive, to, um, to uh, communicate, um, and for us humans to, um, you know, to, to work, to entertain, and to do many things. I'm very proud of this. This is my uh, baby girl uh, <laughs> that was born at the beginning of this year. So, <laughs> oh, you guys are too sweet. <laughs> All right, so. That's the world, uh, that's the very brief history of vision in the animal world. What about the computers? Computer vision had a much shorter, um, shorter history than the animal vision. Actually, we could almost find a, a date back exactly in one summer day at MIT as the birth of computer vision. And that's the summer of 1966. An MIT professor in the MIT AI lab uh, was thinking about what we need to do in AI. And he thinks, well, we've developed AI for quite a few years and it's doing its thing for solar logic and everything is making sense. Actually, let's solve a key piece of the puzzle. Let's solve vision. Vision is easy. You open your eye, you see stuff. So they, the MIT Summer Vision Project is an attempt to use our summer workers, summer workers, not even PhD students, um, they're too good for this. Effectively, in the construction of a significant part of a visual system. That was the ambitious goal that summer, to use a few MIT undergrads to solve it. Well, it's been um, 50 years, and the field of computer vision has blossomed into a major AI subfield. Our conference is like 3,000 people um, per conference. So. Apparently, it was not uh, enough for, for even the smart uh, MIT undergrads uh, for one summer to solve it. So in the early days of computer vision, when, when people are thinking in that time, uh, there were some heroic effort. Here's a very, here's probably what considered the first computer vision PhD by Larry Roberts of thinking about the world, you know, the block world of um, geometric shapes and uh, how they're arranged and how we can uh, um, learn its uh, geometric shape and arrangement and, and do inference on that. Larry Roberts is an interesting guy. He actually subsequently left the field of computer vision but went to work for uh, DARPA and, and was one of the people uh, responsible for starting the internet. Right? So he's uh, nevertheless did very well, uh, not in computer vision but somewhere else. Um, another very important line of work, which uh, go back to our own very lineage, to Tendra's um, own uh, academic dad, <laughs> Tom Binford at Stanford, um, started at his student Rob, uh, Ronnie Brooks, put forward the theory of generalized calendar, uh, not calendar, cylinder, and uh, sorry, uh, in, in object recognition, and start to think about how we can, uh, you know, uh, represent objects in uh, geometric shapes and, uh, and in turn recognize that. Um, Rodney Brook in turn became an MIT professor and uh, did a lot of important work in uh, uh, robotics. Another early line of work is by um, David Lowe. Um, you know, most of you if, you, if you're as old as I am, you know him for the famous uh, uh, the hand engineered feature called SIFT. But even before that, he, he has done very important work in uh, uh, early object recognition, like uh, estimating geometry of straight lines in order to recognize simple shapes like uh, razors. So these are the flavors of the early computer uh, vision work towards the general recognition problem. Well, as heroic as they are, they are very anecdotal and very toyish. They don't really work in real world. There are many reasons for that. You know, one of them is the computers are really, really slow. 
But in general, we didn't have, as a field, a good grasp of the modeling, uh, understanding of the models. So why is vision so hard? Why did the smart MIT professor think this is a problem we can solve in, uh, in a summer? And then after 30 years, we're still dealing with straight lines and finding razors. Well, let me remind you, vision might seem easy for you, but it's actually quite nuanced and quite complex. So here is a, um, a visual illusion that you are all very familiar with. So I can tell you these two mon monsters are digital copies of each other. You know that. I know that. Yet, what you see is a big monster chasing after the small monster. So even though you mathematically can measure the pixels, what you can infer and interpret is very different. So understanding of the visual world is not just about measuring pixels. It's, there's something much deeper to that. Your brain is doing a lot of computation that <coughs> goes beyond the, just the pixel world. Um, here's another example I really like. It's a famous Renaissance painting. Not a single pixel on this painting is about a person. They're about vegetables, fruits, and flowers. Yet, you all see a person. You not only see a person, you see his gender, his age, the shape of his face, his expression, and, and all this, right? So there's a lot that's going on in your brain that is taking the visual information and doing a lot more computation to make sense of the world. And uh, that's what's hard about vision. In fact, it's so hard that after 540 million years, Nature has, has, after all this you know, evolution, devoted half of our brain for visual processing. And nature's really smart. It doesn't waste a molecule. So in order to devote half of our brain, uh, especially the cortical uh, uh, structures for vision, it says two things. One is that it's a really important problem. Nature wants us to get it right. If we don't get it right, we're not gonna survive as individuals or species. Second, it's a really hard problem because nature conserves energy. If we can get it right uh, with fewer uh, neurons or, or, or smaller structure, nature would have done it. So it's a hard problem. And of course, Plato knew this. So, um, so Plato summarized the, the problem of vision very nicely in a, in an example called the prisoners of the allegory of the cave, he says that, you know, imagine there's a bunch of prisoners tied on a chair and forced to look ahead, like you guys are now right now, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, in front of them is a projection, a two-dimensional projection of a play that's going on in the back of their head. So the prisoner's task is to infer what's really happening in the back of their head by looking at the play in 2D projection. And that is the vision problem the human brain has solved. And eventually we want computers to solve. So, uh, so let me say it again for those of you who are not from the uh, field of computer vision. This is why vision is hard. It's fundamentally a EOPOST problem. We're trying to take 2D signals or information of the visual world and infer a 3D structure and, 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 and uh, um, understanding of the visual scene. So given how hard it is, the field of computer vision actually took a little bit of a different approach for about 20 years. Um, so we mostly focused on an equally important problem, but manageable problem called 3D reconstruction. And this is not the purpose of this uh, talk, so I'm not going to get into the depth of it, but a lot of uh, effort has been made into knowing how we can take pictures, uh, multiple pictures, and reconstruct scenes. We don't have to understand what it is, but we can reconstruct it. And uh, you know, this technology has led to some very interesting applications, such as um, you know the the Microsoft PhotoSense application, where you take a lot of tourist pictures of a um, a, a, a landmark site and reconstruct that. And uh, today we're very familiar with, um, uh, with self-driving cars and all the buzz it's making, but within the, the technology of self-driving cars, 3D reconstruction, whether you're using camera-based 
information or LiDAR-based information, uh, the core, one of the core of that technology is 3D reconstruction. And that comes as the fruition of two to three decades of incredible research and uh, a progress made in the field of computer vision. So, so that was, you know, around the time that computer vision as a field was feeling fairly confident about our grasp of 3D, uh, 3D uh, uh, reconstruction. Um, that was the end of the, the, the last century, the beginning of this century. Um, I think people like Alyosha and I started our, our grad school and we became the first, uh, well, you know, after Jitendra, we became the first generation of computer vision st graduate students thinking, re starting to rethink about some of the holy grail problems nature has, has solved for us in vision. And uh, one of that holy grail problem is back to the very beginning, object recognition. How can we, you know, we can reconstruct David, we can reconstruct this Google streets or whatever, but we still have to recognize a bottle, a chair, a car, and a face. So, so that is, um, I think, for the first decade of 21st century and uh, probably two generations of PhD students, that's the problem the field collectively was feverishly working on. So um, for those of you who are not from our field, uh, one of the very, um, very uh, uh, prominent work in, uh, in this uh, uh, object recognition is actually face detection. Face detection was one of the first applications of computer vision that became so robust, it became commercialized quickly. So the famous paper, Viola and Jones, from MIT and Merle in uh, 2001, around 2000, 2001 uses a, uh, at that time, very new machine learning technique called AdaBoost to do real-time face detection in wild images. And you have to give them a lot of credit. At that time, real-time is really pretty incredible because we have pretty bad chips. And then uh, five years later, Fujifilm rolled out the very first digital camera that was capable of doing face detection in real time. Today, all of your smartphones and digital cameras can do this, so you don't even feel it. But we are actually, I remember as a student in computer vision, watching in awe how the technology was unfolding in front of me from the first paper published in, I think, CVPR ICCV, to the actual camera that can carry this technology. And then after face detection, our field uh, started to recognize, wow, we can combine the power of machine learning and, um, and uh, st also starting to, to the, the, the internet is starting to give us some data. We can start to work on the important problem of generic object <coughs> recognition. And during this time, in the first, the first decade of 21st century, a very important effort uh, was led by the European researchers called the Pascal Visual Object Challenge. The Pascal Visual Object Challenge was a data set that uh, uh, is consisted of 20 object classes, you know, like cows and, <coughs> and, and uh, sheep and cats. That's what they have in England. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, and, and challenge the whole field. Let's work on these 20 objects till we get it right, till we can classify the image that contains it and detect where the object is. So you can see they wrote out a challenge and, 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 and <coughs> ask everybody to participate every year. And on the x-axis here is the, is the year and the y-axis is the, the performance and it steadily goes up. So that was all good. That was mostly the, what I observed as a PhD student and then um, as an early <coughs> year assistant professor. Computer vision as a field is slowly cracking open the problem of object recognition. But it was really not satisfying. There's something wrong. We, we can be very proud of these numbers and get hundreds of CVPR, ICCV papers, but it was just not working fully for the real world. So this is a quote 
from a PhD student in my lab. And uh, it actually was in his dissertation. And he said that when I started my PhD in 2010, and I remember being used to seeing cars detected in trees and shrugging my shoulders. So that was his view of the field of computer vision. So, so we spent a lot of time training cars using Pascal. And uh, you know, the, we could get papers published, but they're just not that amazing. So that was around the time I, like Jitendra already gave away that story, I started as an assistant professor and I was thinking about how we can really, um, really crack this problem, how we can really you know, solve the holy grail of computer vision. So I started making an observation of what, it, what does it take for humans to learn objects and, and to learn about the world. And it dawned on me that humans didn't learn, uh, you know, and now I have, uh, I have two babies now uh, in, in my life. They, it, it's not like they are born and then they recognize, you know, I don't know, 30,000 objects. It took them some years to learn. And if you consider our eyes biological cameras, we pretty much take five pictures per second. That's the average time we move our eyes, called a saccade or eye movement. So if you count the waking hours of a baby and then the first three years, literally you would have seen hundreds of millions of pictures. Of course, they, there is correlation, you know, they're not randomly sampled around the world, but that's a huge amount of data. And in addition, it's not just vision, you also touch and you taste, actually they taste a lot. <laughs> and uh, um, so, so that kind of, massive big data sensory input was driving learning. And uh, we were lacking that in our field. Not only we as computer vision field, the whole like NIPS field, the machine learning world was lacking data. And uh, so Professor Kylie and my uh, former student now currently Professor Jaden at uh, Michigan started this ImageNet project and uh, you know, in, a, in a really interesting um, serendipity of history. We, we actually tried ImageNet for a year by hiring Princeton undergrads to, to label data, and it was going nowhere. We, we computed Ja, would, it would take Ja 19 years to graduate if we, uh, <laughs> if we keep going that way. So Jitendra was actually right, I should probably change course. And then one day, a random student walking in the hall said, have you heard of this new thing Amazon rolled out called Amazon Mechanical Turk? And that was early 2017. It was a few months after Amazon Mechanical Turk was built, was rolled out as a service. So, so we hopped on it, and the rest is history. After almost three years, two and a half years of uh, feverish work, lots of uh, sleepless night and lots of money spent, we got a data set of 15 million images organized by 22,000 uh, uh, vocabularies or, or um, uh, in English vocabularies of objects and scenes. And the scale of ImageNet, here's a comparison, was you know, a lot bigger than the, 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 the contemporary data set the world of computer vision was working in. And uh, that really started to change the way we think about the problem and we train the problem, it put a lot of also force or, or pressure on how the models can consume this data. And uh, now you know, as a part of the ImageNet effort, we, we hold an international challenge uh, every year to quantize or benchmark the progress of the field um, and, and by, re by releasing a special ImageNet challenge data set that is a subset of the entire ImageNet data set, which has a million or 1.5 million images and a thousand object classes. And that's when Jitendra's historical role come in. Somewhere in 2011, Jitendra and uh, Jeff Hinton had the phone call and said, you know, if you really think your convolutional or deep learning whatever works, try ImageNet and Jeff Hinton did that. So that's the year 2012 where we, um, we see a huge drop in, uh, in uh, the error rate of image classification 
using convolutional neural network. I remember Alyosha and I both were at the workshop in ECCV 2012. Um, uh, Alex Khrushchevsky was presenting the result, and uh, Alyosha and I were, we couldn't believe it, right? So we're trying to think there's something wrong with the data set. So, <laughs> so um, but uh, for students in the audience, it is fun to look at the history. Again, Jitendra said already, so starting in the 80s, actually 70s, Kunihiko Fukushima's neocognitron and, and a lot of the early efforts by Jeff Hinton and then Yang Lecun already wrote out this architecture of convolutional neural network. So, um, and 2012, AlexNet is not that much different. There is, uh, I think, two key differences. One is ReLU, the other one is Dropout. And uh, um, they are more like, you know, they're, 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 they're not mathematical difference. The, the, the calculus hasn't changed, so gradient descent hasn't changed. But uh, two really important changes, like Jatendra said, one is the hardware change, Moore's law continue to carry us, and especially GPU. Uh, I think uh, Berkeley also has DGX1 that Jensen uh, is probably delivering to guys. So, so NVIDIA has been at the forefront of pushing this, and uh, the big data changed. Um, so the number of pixels that these this uh, high capacity model can, can consume has uh, significantly increased. That really made the change. So you know now um, the, the, the convolutional neural network architecture really has become the winning architecture for object uh, uh, recognition, image classification, and object detection. Here are just some uh, usual results uh, that I'm showing. Detection of a cat, you have to have a cat picture and um, detection of other objects in images, small objects, um, multiple uh, objects, including very, you know, the, the, the long tail objects like fire hydrant and busy, um, and busy scenes. In fact, if you look at the winning architecture of um, the image that challenges in the past uh, four years, it, uh, uh, it you know, the, the, the architecture become more and more complex, the number of layers become, uh, uh, it has increased. Personally, my favorite one is actually VGGNet, because it's actually really simple and elegant compared to the Google Net, which is the Inception Net, which is a bit of a, um, a beast. And then to this year, ResNet from MSR Asia, that has, I think the winning architecture Architecture has 152 layers, but currently they're training on a thousand layers, and uh, just <laughs> just driving the, the 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 technology and the performance of image uh, recognition to really absolute absolutely max. And so, exactly how good is the technology for uh, for image net challenge or image classification? That's a question everybody wants to ask. But there's one person who actually went out to find the answer, and that's Andre Kapathy from, uh, from my lab. Uh, he's now working at OpenAI. He spent uh, a few weeks in, his, in the summer and decided he's just going to train himself to compete on, uh, for image that challenge and see, uh, uh, see how it goes. And here's Andre representing humanity. Um, <laughs> so. So if you read his blog, his error rate is anywhere between 2% to 5%. It really depends on how it goes. Um, and uh, by 2016, the machines are pretty much beating human or on par with human. So we kind of have, at least for ImageNet challenge, we are kind of done, you know. Um, so so, so we are in, we're entering superhuman era. Uh, in in uh, in image uh, image classification, so um, one thing that in Andre's experience representing the rest of humanity is, it's really darn hard to do image that challenge, and the hardest part are recognizing all these damn dogs, according to him. So there are so many fine grained object classes, and uh, and uh, it's just really hard 
to recognize one terrier from another terrier and one corgi. I'm not a dog person. Uh, well, I am a dog person, but I'm not a fine-grained dog person. <laughs> so, so one corgi to another. So, so that actually that experience of you know recognizing large-scale objects um, opened up a new sub-area in computer vision called fine-grained object recognition. So. I actually became very interested in this, you know, so this is, I think Jitendra did some of the work and, and uh, some other labs uh, at, uh, in computer vision did some of the work. This is one area we are going to claim super, superhuman ability by computers very quickly because we are, normal humans are just not that good at recognizing 800 species of birds or a thousand species of insects, or even 200 types of airplanes. This is not how we are trained. This is not what evolution seemed to have optimized. But computers using the deep learning architecture can do really, really well. So here's one example in my lab. Um, a, a couple of years ago, we used the uh, combination of actually a, a detector and a deep deep net uh, classifier to train car detection, fine grain car detection for 3,000 types of cars ever manufactured by humanity after 1990, before Tesla um, Model S. So, um, so, so apparently, the, the, the collectively in the world, the major car companies um, you know, cars are divided into make, model, year. So, uh, make Nissan, two, uh, Nissan Sentra 2005 1.8 S model is one type of car. So there is about 3,000 of that after 1990, and we trained a model that recognized all of them, and we downloaded 50 million Google Street View images from 200 American cities, and. Uh, just can do a mass recognition of the cars. And we, we find very interesting things. For example, we find if you, pr if you look at car, if, if you look at car price by zip code in a, in a region like Boston, it correlates really well with the 2010 American census of household income. Really, really well. And red is very expensive cars, yeah. Um, and uh, this is kind of not surprising, rich people buy better cars, but uh, we also can show that average car price by zip code predicts city crime rates. We even know which type of car that is highly likely to be correlated with crime. So I'm not using the word causality, but correlated. Are you ready for this? Do you want to guess which type of car? So I have one, I have to confess. <laughs> minivans. So apparently they're great for drug dealing. <laughs> <laughs> a tip in life. If you're thinking about that, minivan is good. <laughs> so so, uh, so we, we can find a lot of more things I don't have time to, to share with you, but that's the kind of fine gray recognition we can do and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, give uh, some interesting statistics of the, uh, the world. Um, uh, we also used uh, image <coughs> I the image net um, data set as well as um, uh, a, a smart machine learning models to do recognition for this type of objects, right? <laughs> so you don't really know exactly what it is, but we can actually optimize a model so that it, um, it is a joint optimization of rewarding the model to give you a correct label as specific as possible, but punishing it if it makes a mistake. So you want these two forces drives the model to find the best answer possible in object recognition. So that's what it has. And here is another example. Um, so, so anyway, here is a, a little bit of a Fabe-centric view of what have we been doing as a field in object recognition. There has been a lot of other work by other groups. Uh, Jatendra's group from uh, in segmentation, pose recognition, you know, uh, Alyosha's work in um, analogous uh, uh, images and, and objects. But um, 
at this point, we're pausing to think, let's just claim a, a pretty good victory of object recognition. There's still a lot more work to be done, but we've done a lot as a field. We've driven ImageNet uh, uh, performance all the way to superhum uh, superhuman um, uh, um, uh, region. And uh, so what is beyond object recognition, right? So what is the next holy grail we're going after? And this I want to bring you back to actually one of the psychology studies or cognitive neuroscience studies I've done when I was a graduate student uh, or about <coughs> to graduate is what exactly can humans see? We all know we can see and we can see effortlessly, but how much can we see? So in this experiment, if you were my subject, I would put you in front of a gray screen and ask you to stare at the cross. And then I'm going to ask you to start the trial. For every trial, there is going to be a photo that flash at you and it's taken away. And in order to control how long that photograph stays on your retina, I'm going to wash that photo with some wallpaper gibberish pattern. And then you're going to type, uh, if you are my subject, everything you've seen in this scene. Um, so, and I'll pay you $10 if you do a good job. So I'm not going to pay you $10 today, but you can experience what these uh, photos look like. So, so these are the pictures you've never seen before, yet most of you get the gist of the scene, right? The shortest amount of time, presentation time on screen for the human subjects is 27 milliseconds. That's almost a 40th of a second. The longest time is 500 milliseconds. That's literally half of a second. Yet you have no problem seeing what the, prob uh, the, the, what the picture is. And here is an actual experimental data result. This is w a few subjects looking at this particular scene and writing down everything they see. You know, I kind of regret I only paid them $10 um, because maybe they'll write even longer. By 500 milliseconds, they're writing novels. You know, they're telling you it's a game or a fight. There's two groups of two men. One is in the fr foreground with getting a fist in the face and blah, blah, blah. It's just really long. So here's another second holy grail of, of visual intelligence. And this is special to humans. No other animals do that. You know, monkeys can recognize objects, but humans can tell stories. A picture is worth a thousand words, and it's literally true. So how do we generate captions from a picture became the next thing that I personally became very interested in, and there is a lot of contemporary work. Um, there is actually a huge amount of work done before the big data era, before the deep learning era, using generative models, Bayesian network, uh, uh, and or graphs. I'm not going to get into that, but this is a problem as a field we cared a lot about. And this is a really tough problem. For those of you who are um, not in our field, I want you to appreciate how hard it is one more time. So you see a dog jumping over a hurdle, but the computer sees this. You know, it's just a bunch of RGB numbers. And from this, you have to make, a, uh, make sense of what the content of the image is and write a story about it. So um, uh, 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 almost two years ago, and contemporary to other efforts, including one at Berkeley, my student uh, Andrea and I started this uh, using a deep learning network to, uh, to train a model that can tell the story or caption an image. And the model really consists of two parts. One is the part that represents the image, and the other part is generate sentence. Um, so the image representation part is a convolutional neural network that was the core of the, the object recognition model we've seen and all the image net uh, uh, challenge models are convolutional or variations of conv convolutional neural network models. And we use that to represent image. And um, you know, some of you might be curious why is a convnet uh, useful for representing image? Because it captures structure. The lower layers of ConvNet captures 
simple structure, like edge-like structure, by the time you're in the upper layer, it's capturing parts of objects, parts of the thing. I, I, I'm not gonna get into the details, but that's what we use to represent our images. And then for the language model, we use the recurrent um, neural network model. Uh, at that time, we just used a simple RN, and now we can you know, think about LSTM and all this. So a recurrent uh, neural network model is just a um, model uh, that takes an input, w w you know, optimizes some, some hidden layer, generates an output, and then just keep going in a sequential way. It's a, it's a sequ uh, sequential model. And uh, we put this together, and now we can test how our uh, deep learning model uh, does for, uh, uh, for image captioning. Um, so here's a little bit of an inside look at this. So at the beginning of a training process, the model is not really, not very good. So, um, <laughs> so it's just a bunch of random words, you know, it's really drawing from just what it has seen before, so it kind of doesn't make any sense. And then after a few iterations, it starts to make a little bit of sense, there's a girl. And then another few iterations, the girl in red dress, it's getting good, it's not red, but at least it, it's getting there. And then this is what the final model says, a girl in pink dress is jumping in the air. So, so you can see gradually the model is learning, and uh, I find this very impressive. Um, when Andre showed me actually this very image and this very caption, I was like, okay, we can submit to CVPR. So, <laughs> and uh, here is another example, a man in black shirt is playing guitar. And uh, so I wanna make sure if you're thinking, is this just regurgitating uh, sentences it learned in, uh, in training? So it turned out, Half of the sentences that we get in testing time are newly generated novel sentences that never occurred in, uh, in training. So there is definitely a generalization going on. Um, I'm just gonna speed up. By the way, how, many, how much time do I have? Five. Five minutes, all right. This is like the first half of my talk. All right, <laughs> so, so anyway, the numbers look good. And uh, we do make mistakes, like this one, you know, the young boy is holding a baseball bat. This is actually kind of a freaky uh, mistake. So I don't, I, I think the guy is, <laughs> is the guy is a bit fluffy. So, um, so okay, so here is the, you know, like this talk so far, we really have seen a tremendous progress in the field of computer vision. We went from, you know, detecting 20 objects in Pascal and hallucinating cars in the forest to very good object detection all the way to uh, superhuman level with fine grained classes to, you know, image, center, image caption generation. So if I were to have another 50 minutes, I would start to talk about three important questions that probably is going on in your mind, right? One is, what do we, like, what is a little bit the inner workings of these models? What does, does this model truly understand? Second is, what about videos? Um, what about actions? Are they just like frames stitched together? That's another really important question. And then third one is really what's next, right? We're driving image that challenge to, to, to superhuman level. We're getting image captioning, what's next? So um, I'm gonna try to do really fast, just a few uh, samples. So this is a question I'll probably just gloss over. So what do we truly understand the model? One is to really visualize the, the language and the model and see if we actually get good alignment of, of, um, of uh, semantic knowledge. For example, if the sentence said dog, uh, where exactly is dog, right? Like can we find a bounding box for dog? So this is the inner working of the CVPR paper that shows we actually have meaningful image um, uh, words alignment. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna um, pass this. Another thing is, can we look at these models and see if they really can help us to detect objects that needs context to understand? So this is actually a really hard problem. In ImageNet challenge analysis, we find out small objects 
are the hardest objects to detect. A lot of models fail. And uh, in our sentence generation uh, work, we notice if we're putting this whole thing into a bigger story context, we're capable of detecting small objects like head of a giraffe or the white tennis shoes or the phone uh, or the front wheel of a bus. So these are some, some uh, peeks into the inner workings of the vision part of the model. We also did some analysis on the language part of the model, mostly contrasting RNN network or, or, or a specific RNN called LSTM versus a uh, vanilla 20 gram language model. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, this is an Eichler paper. I'm totally just gonna skip. Uh, sorry about that. So another um, question I said is what about video? There has been a lot of work done in the field about videos. Uh, I'm just showing you a few work from my lab. For example, together with Google YouTube, we released a one million uh, YouTube image, uh, sorry, video, 450 sports class data set and uh, uh, developed a model that recognized these different classes. So um, now uh, this is a work by Andre where the model can predict frame by frame what class of uh, uh, sports it is and there are 450 different type of class. So it's a pretty difficult problem. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this one. This is an embedding work. I, I'll just skip, sorry. Um, in the other work we just recently published, we used a LSTM model, um, a, a nested L LSTM model to, to detect uh, key players that are performing actions in sports games, such as basketball game, three-pointer shots, and so on. Uh, 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 this is a uh, heat map of showing how a three-pointer shot can, can happen. I'm gonna skip this. Um, we're working with Stanford Hospital to detect human poses and gestures using depth data. And this is also a attention-based uh, LSTM model to predict <coughs> human pose in very, in very challenging angles, not just the, the frontal view that you normally see, but, but uh, uh, top-down views and, and uh, how we can uh, uh, recognize the poses. Uh, here's a fun one where we use um, a, a model to recognize social roles in uh, events such as weddings. So this is automatically, ta automatically tagged by the machine on, uh, on, uh, on, um, on, the, um, uh, on the video. Uh, in collaboration with um, uh, with Silvio's lab, Silvio Ceresi's lab, we're also doing large-scale human mobility studies of tracking millions of humans and using uh, social signals that, that such as social affinity. And this is a recent uh, uh, CVPR paper called Social LSTM to, to predict humans. This is in context with the robotics work where how do we put a robot in the last mile of driving where there is a huge crowd and how the robot can learn to navigate with social manners uh, among, uh, among people. So I'm gonna skip this. Um, so two more minutes. Um, so the last question is, what's next for, for visual intelligence, right? And I wanna, I wanna tease you with this quote. It's a very <coughs> famous quote I got from a very thoughtful AI paper written by Terry Winograd called Thinking Machines. And here's the quote. The definition of AI is a computer that m makes a perfect chess move while the rest of the room is on fire. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we ch changed the word chess to go and it's very timely. So th this is today's AI. We are task focused and we are super good at a task but we don't have a sense of context, we don't have a good common sense knowledge, and we don't know how to integrate this together. And this is very telling from the image that uh, data set, right? Like with the image like this, image that gives you one label, a woman or a lady, but really there are many, many objects in the scene. Recently, there is a very good data set released by Microsoft that gives you a couple of sentences 
of the, this picture, but really there is actually many sentences that can describe this picture, and we can even put question and answer <coughs> pairs into this picture. And on top of that, we can also add relationship data, right? Every, uh, we can have women wearing coat and then refer back to specific people in the scene. So a scene is really rich. There's a lot of context, there's a lot of knowledge, and they actually form a very complex relationship graph that can uh, describe the world. And not only every scene has a graph or, or giant graph like this, the world of images is an even more giant uh, graph, interconnected. So every, every object in every scene can, can find itself in the big giant graph of the universe of the, the image and the uh, universe of the uh, visual knowledge. And imagine if we had this, we would have a, uh, a, a rich source of knowledge that would uh, tell us more about what the visual world is like and what are the common sense knowledge. And this is what um, the ongoing effort at uh, Stanford is. It's the visual genome data set we're going way beyond what ImageNet can give us. We can, uh, you know, this is a data set right now has 100,000 uh, images, but for, for, for these images, we offer uh, 2 million image descriptions, 1.8 million uh, visual question uh, uh, answer pairs, uh, millions, millions of uh, objects and uh, uh, tens of thousands of object classes, relationships, attributes, and, uh, and, and correspondences. So if you're curious, you can just go to visualgenome.org and, uh, and check out this open source data set. So I'm not going to go into every single uh, project anymore, but let me just use this slide to summarize. If I had time, I was gonna share with you four recent project that's coming out of the visual genome effort in an attempt to understand the visual world in a richer way. So the first project is relationship prediction. We're again going beyond nouns. We're trying to predict a person riding a horse, a, a elephant standing next to a tree. There are many different kind of relationships. We have recently just published the ECCV paper on that. We also uh, we have an image retrieval um, project that can take complex sentences, not just Google image retrieval, you say a cute cat. We can say uh, a white woman and a black man is sitting at a dinner table having a, a good conversation in a restaurant. Use that kind of rich sentence structure to do image retrieval. This is something that note, you know, if you go to Google uh, image search, you cannot do today. We also have uh, done working visual question answering using attention-based LSTM model to simultaneously answer questions as well as uh, label or annotate scenes. And then the last work is a dense cap that um, is instead of captioning an image with one sentence, we can caption an image with re different regions and one sentence per region. And in submission to this coming CVPR, we're putting this together and generating, for the first time, what my cognitive study is showing us, which is, uh, uh, which is paragraphs. So that's the full work that I'm not gonna go into the details about, but I'm gonna finish with one last thing, uh, but you have to bear with me, because uh, um, I have to scroll. Uh, there's a lot of slides. I was telling Jitendra that I didn't finish my talk last night, and this is what happens. Um, I was gonna clean up some of these slides. All right, um, so, so this is the dense cap. This is the dense cap work where we generate multiple sentences per image, and uh, this is the paragraph work where we generate paragraphs. So, um, all right, so where are we going next if, 
you know, we're, we're trying to use visual genome to drive us towards a bigger understanding of context. Uh, so the next, uh, the next couple of slides, I hope it's not gonna make you cry. Um, so suppose we have an image, what have we learned? What can today's computer vision do? Well, we can recognize objects such as people and poses. Jitendra has done a lot of work. We can do good 3D understanding or rough 3D understanding of the scene. We can write a sentence about this, a group of people in a room. We can even write multiple sentences about the scene. That's where we are as a field. But this is still not enough because as humans, um, you see a lot more, and today you're gonna feel a lot more. So, <laughs> so we see the people here, we see the mood, you know, it's happy, humorous. There's a lot of subtle activities going on, and you know, today I see it in a sad way, um, but, <laughs> but this is our visual experience. Computers today, despite the fact we've made a lot of, uh, made a lot of uh, um, progress, we are nowhere near in integrating the, not only the pixel information, but also the world knowledge, our common sense knowledge, uh, intention, intentionality, purpose, emotion into this. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. And again, I wanna thank the students who, um, who have you know, helped me to do all this work and uh, before I, uh, I, I, I finish this, I wanna just, uh, if you're interested in not only in the technology of AI, but the dissemination of AI, talk to me afterwards. We have been working for the past two years on a outreach camp, summer camp at Stanford called Sailors for AI. Uh, to, to uh, disseminate AI to K-12 schoolers. And this year we're starting a national nonprofit organization called AI for All. And uh, I really wanna invite Berkeley to uh, participate in this. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, really sorry. I'm sure a uh, couple of you, since we're a little bit over time, have to leave right now, so we'll, why don't we just wait to let the room turn over, and then we can take a couple of questions, and then maybe afterwards you can also take a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm tomorrow. happy to uh, stay. All right, raise your hand if you have a question. is kind of fixed, right, after you design it. So um, so in that case, uh, the number of inputs for pixels is kind of fixed, but you're getting images with different with different sizes and different pixel numbers and stuff. So do you, you always resize? the image. Can you okay. repeat the question? The question is, how do you handle the different various sizes of input image? You can just normalize it. Okay. Um, because I was thinking about uh, the 3D application and that you get a 3D triangular mesh instead of a and, and, and that kind of Even in 3D, you can normalize the size. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the second question is less technical, is that uh, as humans, you never just use visual systems, but you use auditory systems and, and other Haptics. So yeah. is there any process in integrating different sensories together? So that's an excellent question. Do we integrate sensory? So I haven't done any, but Okay, so, so first of all, there is integration of sensory in the visual domain. The depth sensor, infrared sensor, RGB sensor, especially in self-driving cars and roaming robots, there's already an integration. But you're talking about uh, integration of um, speech of vision or haptics of vision. Uh, it, I, I'm not aware of work in that yet. I think people are starting to think about this. This is a great, especially in the robotic concept, uh, context, I think it's a great direction to go. 
Okay, uh, I wonder if we can have uh, another question. And so I was expecting a lot of questions from the students, but I have my own question. Okay. It seems like at first uh, you were trying to identify images, mm -hmm. and so you would, you would connect the word to the image. And I said, well, that seems like something that you can do. But as your talk evolved toward the end, you're actually uh, trying to present concepts in English. And that's really, really hard. <laughs> and uh, and is, it, is it so hard that maybe it's presumptuous, that, like you've lost track of the images, you're trying to create sentences that make sense. And I, I see the computer, it's correlating things, it's not actually understanding anything. Yeah. So is, are you being too ambitious? <laughs> Yes, and that's what science is about. <laughs> so yes, we're definitely, we're always trying to be too ambitious. So I think you're right. Does the computer really understand the sentence as you and I do, right? I think this is a very interesting question. Philosophically, what's the word understanding? I think there is some understanding. I mean, I, I was rushing because if I had time, I would show that the words are corresponding to the right kind of pixel region, so it's not just saying there's a dog jumping over a hurdle. It actually knows where the dog is, where the hurdle is, that there's work I didn't show in detail about relationship prediction. It can tell you there's a horse, there's a person, and one is riding versus standing next to. So that level of understanding, it's starting to happen. But our human understanding has a whole different layer. That layer connects us back to knowledge, back to the cognitive uh, connection of the, the world out there. And right now, there's no representation in deep learning that g gets us that. So, Stu? Uh, so I couldn't help noticing that the phrase innocent breath appeared in the Urufa-generated captions, uh, uh, the little girl jumped in the air with a pink dress and the lady on two innocent breath, uh. even though the lady on two wasn't wearing a pink dress. That, that's the so data so issue, right? So, so one question is, if you took those photos and, and just changed the color of the dress to green to yellow, so that you were using word combinations, or the appropriate word combinations, something that never appeared in the, uh, in the training set, right? even though the individual words may have appeared. So how, how, how would I think it helped express the generalization? Right, so, so I wish I can spend more time showing you. So first of all, these are supervised learning algorithms. So in the training process, we actually have image sentence pairs. So, you know, there, if we, we're like, we can have a green shoe, uh, a, a man is wearing a green shoe, a woman is wearing a pink dress. So with enough training, like we actually think, uh, we actually know the algorithm is capable of learning the concept of green and pink. So next time in a general, in a testing scenario, if a woman is wearing a green sweater or green shirt, the algorithm is capable of making that connection. That is the best case scenario. But when the training has overwhelmingly uh, large amount of data that is about pink dress, then the, the, the algorithm does overfit. So, so it, it, it does make a mistake and try to be too happy with the word pink. Actually, we have a lot of happy uh, sentence with the word cat, because the, the internet is full of cat, and the, the, the model really thinks everything fluffy is a cat. So, so we do have that issue. But it is trying to learn, so it's not purely being stupidly memorizing. large pink square box. Right, that would be challenging. Yeah, so, so everything in deep learning structure right now, it depends on the amount of data, right? Like, you know, if we have a, it doesn't have the reasoning you and I do. So if there is enough data, sure. If not, it, okay. it's. So owing to the pressure of time, there's a class coming oh, into this room. Sorry. Uh, uh, we have to uh, continue our discussions with Fei Fei uh, outside. But uh, let's uh, thank her again for this conversation.